department. Um, very honored and privileged to introduce a good friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Kirk Dossi. Uh, Dr. Dossi is a man of many hats and many talents. On my way over, I was actually thinking about as some of you are getting ready, hopefully, to graduate this spring. One of the popular books that they hand out to graduates is All the Places You Will Go by Dr. Seuss. So a lot of times I think of Dr. Dossi very similar, and I'm envious of all the places he, have, he has been, as well as all the different hats he has worn. Uh, by training, his uh, doctorate is in uh, medical physiology from Boston University. He has spent time in academia, both at Boston University and Tufts University. He's also been actively involved and an advocate for devices uh, in industry, having been with Thermo Cardio Systems. Uh, he's worked with Geno on nitric oxide. Uh, he's been involved in a number of electronics and magnet magnetically levitated blood pumps. Uh, he is sort of the guru uh, when it comes to mechanical circulatory support devices. I was very fortunate to meet Dr. Dossi a number of years ago through an organization we're both part of called the SIO, American Society of Artificial and Internal Organs. Uh, we actually got to sit on a board together, and that's how I got to know uh, Dr. Dossi. Um, more recently, very, very pleased that we were able to work together collaboratively on a development of a pediatric device that uh, hopefully we can share with you sometime in the future. Uh, very, very special lecture today. Uh, something a little different, but hopefully very informative uh, for our bioengineering students. Uh, I had asked Dr. Dossi uh, to, to share with you, based on some of his experience in industry, that would be of value for a number of you uh, as you work on medical devices. Uh, so with that, Dr. Dossi, my honor and privilege. I'm looking forward to your lecture. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Koenig, for that really nice uh, introduction. George, I see you back there. I didn't know you were coming here. Yeah, I'm Kurt. We've also, I've also worked with George forever. Uh, I don't know how many years, but uh, at least a couple couple decades. Uh, so today, I thought we'd have a little fun and do something that's really outside the box. And you may even question why we're even talking about this. But I thought we'd talk about, rather than um, you know my career and events that have happened in it, or teach you something important like the second law of thermodynamics, uh, we'd actually talk about a real life uh, situation which turned out to be a bit of a crisis for a young medical company. Uh, and that obviously was, um, was a class one recall that we received. So it's, it's, it was a, a real challenge for the company. And you know, what my role here is, is really to talk to most of you that are thinking about going into industry as engineers and kind of put into the big context what it's like to work in an engineering company. And uh, so if I, if I talk about the purpose of uh, what I want to share with you, I'd say uh, a lot of times when young engineers enter industry, uh, they want to do what, you know, what's fun, and that is design and develop innovative new medical technologies. And it truly is a, an exciting and, and a rewarding thing to do in industry. But there are a number of other roles that you will also have to play. And the first of which is, um, on a day-to-day -day basis, you're going to do a lot of problem solving. And it's inevitable that when you join a medical company, there's probably going to be some device in the field which has software, electronic components, mechanical components that are subject to possible malfunctions and failures. And so that's a little bit about what we're going to talk about today. Uh, you're going to be asked whether you're an entry level engineer or a senior level engineer to participate in failure analyses, uh, root cause analyses to really try to troubleshoot you know, what led to this problem in the field and how we're going to fix it. And the second role you're going to play though is in, in a medical device company, engineers become the hub of the company. And you can think of a, of a wheel with a hub, that's the engineers, and there are all these other departments that are supporting you and that you're working with. And you're going to have to really step up the bat and show leadership skills and, uh, and try to show that, uh, that you can really get the problem solved. And then, in addition, you're going to have to put on your charm and put on your people skills because you're going to have to develop relationships, not only with your peers in terms of other engineers, but You'll have to do that with other representatives of other departments to really gain their confidence in you, in the engineering team, and their trust. So the other thing I'm going to use this seminar for is to really kind of put it into context for 
you know, engineers that might be entering industry, the, the whole overall contact with the company, how do you work with regulatory quality, manufacturing, sales, and marketing? You're going to be working with all these different departments. It's not just focusing on developing a device. And last but not least, I want to really emphasize that this case can really uh, hopefully help um, illustrate the importance of the roles that you're going to be playing in the industry. So the objectives of the presentation are, first of all, just kind of give you an overview of who Levitronics was, what the medical, medical company was doing. I want to talk a little bit about what the problem was that came up that led to a recall. I'd then like to, um, to pause a little bit along the way and ask a few questions uh, related to ethical moral issues that came up. And I'm going to ask you to participate in what would you do. Uh, I want to talk about negotiations of really between the engineers and the outside world. In this case, it was with the Food and, food and Drug Administration. Uh, and how to turn an adversarial relationship around in one of trust, and how you also have to, as engineers, develop relationships internally with um, other engineers and, and the rest of the company. And then it might be nice at the end to tell you how we actually resolve the problem. So the case study. Um, well, Levitronic was a medical device company. Um, it was faced with this adversarial relationship with the Food and Drug Administration, in this case with the Compliance Division. And I think it's probably worth taking a minute and describing FDA. I was just there about a week ago, and i got to go again in June. So when you go to FDA, I don't know, there's probably 66 buildings in Silver Spring. You've got the food part, you've got the drug part, and you've got the medical device part. And the medical device part, um, we refer to as the Centers of Disease and Radiological Health, CDRH. But then you also have the compliance side. And the compliance side, when they walk into your facility, can be um, wearing just a uniform, or they can come in with machine guns and bulletproof vests and really come in for the purpose of cease and desist for taking over your company. That happens. So, you really don't want the compliance side necessarily coming into your company unless you have problems. And when they come in, let's just say that you're typically guilty before proven innocent. Um, so, uh, so uh, let's just talk about who Levitronics was. So, as I, Levitronics actually um, was probably about five or six years old when this happened. The company had both the medical device division, but we also developed a non-medical side, an industrial division. And on this industrial side, we called it fluid handling business, and um, what we did there is we took the very same pump that we developed for the medical and simply made it more rugged for the industrial side. And we, we were um, rapidly leaders in the semiconductor industry for, uh, for us, uh, a number of different industries. Um, there was wet bench processing of wafers, uh, where we processed them for the semiconductor industry with uh, acid washes, alkali washes, prepped them before they were made into chips. That was one business. We then moved into what was called uh, uh, chemical mechanical planarization. What is that? We provide a slurry uh, for a polishing agent that would plane off nanometer defection, you know, defects in. Uh, wafers to uh, increase yield, and we became number one in the industry for doing that. We then moved into photolithography, gold plating, copper plating, and even bioreactors for drug manufacturing. What was interesting is that the fluid handling business generated revenue so that we could then support the development of the medical business and eventually become very profitable in a very short period of time. So this is a company that investors really love. And we were on a roll at the time. So um, as far as the medical business, what we really became rapidly uh, known for is a leader in, in a magnetically limited technology. And we applied that to the, to the development of both adult and pediatric type devices uh, for circulatory support. And then, uh, and then we moved uh, also into artificial lung respiratory support and developed technology for that. And uh, we're an international company. Um, you know, I was the founder and the CEO. Uh, we home-based ourselves in Boston. Uh, so it was a US entity, but 
half the company was in Zurich, Switzerland. So we work with great engineers out of the ETH uh, Institute of Switzerland and actually pulled them out of the university and set up a company and had half our company over there. Um, so we had a lot of experience as a team in working in ventricular assist devices. We um, had worked initially on the HeartMate pneumatically driven device. We worked on the uh, what was known as the XBE. I don't know how many people are familiar with it, but it was a, a one of the pioneering devices and one of the first devices to get approved by FDA as a implantable left ventricular assist device. And we'd also worked not only in that, but some of us have worked on HeartMate 2 as well, which became the market leader up until recently when the next generation has come out. So we had a fair amount of experience uh, going into this business. Um, and as far as our products, we had developed what was called a Centromag uh, ventricular assist device. And the Centromag, you know, I had looked at the market. I had seen that there were short-term devices for cardiopulmonary bypass that would um, be approved for up to six hours, and then there were long-term systems that were approved for bridge to transplant, etc. But there really wasn't much um, in between. There was no device for up to 30 days um, as a bridge to decision to decide whether you could stabilize a patient and they could either recover, go on the transplant, or possibly go into a long-term system. So uh, we developed the Centromag and. Um, it was used uh, initially for adults, but eventually we moved it into pediatric uh, use for patients uh, greater than 25 kilograms. We then developed a, a pediatric version of this. We called it in the United States PD Mag, but it's also PD Bass. And it's simply um, another pump head that could put in, be put into the same maglev motor and control system and be used now for pediatric patients. And it was designed in this case for patients less than 25 kilograms all the way down the near. Um, and both these devices uh, today are in wide use. The third device that we de developed was called Ultramag, and um, this was my, one of my favorite devices we developed. It was a titanium version. It was only about two inches wide. Uh, what was unique about it is that we, it was a fully functional ventricular assist system that could be used for adult or pediatrics. It would cost 10% of what it costs to develop the other devices. And so the company got acquired and the first comment of the acquirer was, well, that's a poor man's bed. And yeah, we said, well, <coughs> India, China, South America, there are other places where we can't really afford this technology. And the response was, well, if that gets on the market, it's going to cannibalize our high pricing. So it's never going to see that. So it was viewed as a threat and a competition to the pricing of the expensive devices today. So it's a shame it's still sitting on the shelf and never, it's all, it's been fully tested, ready to go, but it's never been used. And similarly, we developed a respiratory assist device. So, so anyone that knows uh, uh, the area of ECMO, you know that you have a pump, you have an oxygenator, you have a heat exchanger, etc., with tubing and connectors between. What we did with this device is we, we integrated a pump and then we took state-of-the-art hollow fibers, which are polymethylpentene, and we even incorporated a heat exchanger into a single module. And then that was to be placed either into the motor of the, of the, um, of the Centromag or the Ultramag. And it could be either a wearable or a bedside um, ECMO unit. Um, and the interesting thing about this respiratory assist technology is it was designed as a 30-day module. And so if we had, say, a COPD patient wearing the, the Ultramag with an exchangeable module, if we kept them alive five years, that's 60 respiratory assist units sold. Uh, you only sell one bed. So from a business perspective, this is three times the bad market. The acquirer bought it. They are not in the respiratory assist market. It sits on the shelf. So I call it, you know, life's not fair sometimes. But that's the way it happened. Anyway, that was that was who we were as Levitronics. And um, for those of you that may have heard of HeartMate 3, you may not know that we at Levitronics developed all of uh, the electromagnetics for HeartMate 3. And the current results with HeartMate 3, they've shown the stroke rate has dropped from 19% on HeartMate 2 to 10% on HeartMate 3. Um, so there's some 
dramatic improvements in adverse event rates as a result of releasing this. So we're pretty excited to have been involved with that. But now I'm going to get to the point. Uh, so what we're going to focus on is a problem that happened with the Centromag system. And uh, just to let you know a little bit more, Centromag uh, was comprised of a pump. It's only a five-part pump. It has an upper and lower polycarbonate housing. And inside it has a three-part, um, three uh, which include the veins, the magnet, and a cap. So it's five parts to that device. It costs us $40 to make it, and uh, Thortex sells it for $12,000. So pretty good margin on that device. Uh, that pump simply uh, was placed in the motor, and the motor is attached to the drive console, and you're ready to go as an outside the body after the core off system. So at the time this problem occurred, we had about 8,000 8, patients have been treated. So it wasn't like we you know, treated 10 or 100. We had 8,000 patients treated. We had an average survival worldwide of 47%, which is compared to 25% uh, with any other device at the time. So almost twice the survival at this point. And we were in 150 centers, about 45 countries when this happened. We'd had a lot of pediatric experience. We'd shipped over, you know, 750 uh, pediatric devices. I always love this picture with, uh, you know, the actual patient, and you can see the uh, the setup, but then the foot next to the pump. And then um, we also were really well known for, uh, you know, capturing patients in Austria, transporting them like this to Germany, and you can see the baby, and you can see what it takes to actually move an ECMO patient. Um, it's just a, a lot of people and a lot of instrumentation and a lot of effort, but we were doing a lot of this at the time very safely. So what was the case? What actually happened? Well, we had a first event. It occurred in Argentina. Um, it occurred outside the jurisdiction of FDA. Um, what happened was, apparently, we got a phone call from someone that was speaking Spanish that the device had been operating, they were in the operating room, um, suddenly they got a visual alert um, that there was a problem, and then the device shut down, right? And the patient, um, while the patient was on support. And so, to resolve the problem, they simply rebooted the device, and the patient continued on support. There was no injury to the patient. Uh, the patient was perfectly fine. And so here we are. Um, we've done all these patients. And um, we hear that, uh, you know, that the, the system alerted and shut down and then they blew it back up and the patient was fine. But why did that happen? So um, why would the system shut down during support? Well, first of all, it was designed to do exactly what it did. It was designed to alert you uh, and shut down if it thought it was sensing that the being heller, that rotating component, may not, may not be centered properly um, and uh, it may be you know, operating in a potentially unsafe manner. And so what, I mean, what do I mean by that? <clears throat> Since we got the impeller and we are electromagnetically controlling its, its, its orbit, its central position, and causing it to rotate, if, on the other hand, that orbit um, widened and it touched the side, it could cause a scratch or a problem leading to thrombus, leading to potential thromboembolism and stroke. So rather than continue to operate, our system was taught and trained and programmed to say, wait a minute, there's a problem. It, could not be, it might not be operating properly. It'll shut down. So when that happened, um, we were, our users were instructed to just, OK, either reboot, see if it works, or go to backup. It's an alarm condition. If that happened, uh, the user could do it within about two, within about two minutes. It's a very short period of time to go to backup or move it. Um, so the bottom line, the console operated like it was supposed to, like it was designed. It's supposed to do that. So, and the FDA had reviewed this design and approved it under multiple 510Ks and, and uh, HDE five times. So they're very familiar with the system and how it operated. So let's stop for a minute and say, what, what should we have done? We get this call from Argentina. 
we're, we're not really able to understand what the problem is. We just know that it did shut off and apparently did what it was supposed to do. But still, why, is it, why did it do that? And so the, the ethical question is to um, you as engineers, now you're in our company, we're going to, Priscilla Petit, who's standing against the wall back there, is from Quality. She walks into your office and says, I just heard about this. What are you guys going to do about it? Um, so do, do we need to start a failure investigation at this point? What do you think as engineers? It's a big deal to start once you start it. And the second question is, now we know this, and we're starting, you know, if we start an investigation, we've got 8,000 of these out there, but we hear that this happened, do we need to make a design change? Should we start working on making a design change at this point? So I don't blame you for not answering this question now, but you're going to help me answer in the next one in the next slide. Because the answer is, by law, when you get a call like that, uh, by the regulations of FDA, it is a complaint. It is, it, it may be operating the way you think it should, but it, it doesn't appear to be operating the way it's intended, it's designed, even though it's, it did what it's supposed to be. Because at the end of the day, we had it shut off in the middle of support. Um, so yes, we have to start an investigator, uh, an investigation analysis, and we also have to document we got to call, make sure it's all written down, it has to be prepared to file for to notify agencies and let everybody know about it. But, you know, given the fact that it, it actually did what it's supposed to do, um, there's no reason to begin on an N01 making design changes at this point. However, two years later, we get a report of a second event that was identical to this, and this time it came from the United Kingdom, and this time we were speaking to English-speaking folks who could describe what was going on. Again, did what it was supposed to do, no injury in the patient, but this time we actually learned what the problem was. So what was the problem? The problem was we were getting interference from a, an electrical cautery unit. So in other words, um, you know, the patient had some bleeding, they had an electrical cautery or electric surgical unit there, they were using the, the wand, if you will, to, um, to stop the bleeding, do the electrical cautery. Somehow when they turned that on, it was interfering with our device. So we had a motor, as you know, that contained a magnetic bearing. It, um, you know, that magnetic field again controlled the, um, and centered the impeller and, and uh, caused it to uh, rotate and impart torque. Um, we had position centers in our motor that were sensing where these, um, these, um, what the position of the impeller was, and um, they were actually mounted just like this. So we had eight poles. We had little eddy current sensors in there, and. As the impeller was rotating, we could actually use software to sense where they were and then control the position of the, of the device, of the impeller. And so, um, so the impeller was, um, it was um, being monitored by these eddy current sensors and they were operating at about 300 uh, kilohertz frequency. The interesting thing is that when they turned the electrical surgeon, surgery unit on, it also operated with a harmonic of 300 uh, kilohertz. And uh, moreover, when they turned it on, um, and because they were contacting the body, that voltage actually was transmitted right through the blood to the pump, into the motor, and up to the controller uh, to say something's going on here. And uh, so the sensor system assumed the impeller might be at risk of making contact with the motor. With the, and so it triggered the alarm condition. And the bottom line is that operation of this electrical surgical unit caused um, interference with our system. Now, you may say, well, you know, there's so much rigorous testing that has to go on these medical devices. You know, how could it be possible that you made it through electrical safety and you didn't catch this? So, and this just illustrates what we're saying. You know, this is the electrical cautery unit. It was being used on the patient. It was picked up uh, and transmitted by the blood to the, the pump, the motor, and then ultimately. A little uh, other unfortunate fact is that on both occasions, we later were able to learn that they were plugging all of the equipment into extension cords. Uh, there's no, uh, there's very likely that the patient was not grounded at all. 
Uh, so you, that's life in the big world, but the bottom line is that seemed to be what we got the problem. Yeah, so before I go on now, so now we know that we got a problem. And we know that when they turn that like a car unit on, um, it's at risk of just shutting down. So this, I'm, this, this time you're going to have to help me. It, do we have enough information at this point that we should take this device off the market? I mean, we have, this is where we were. You know, this is the way life is in, in the industry. You got a real ethical issue here. Should we be letting that device be out there at risk of being shut down every time that electric pottery unit comes on and the patient goes down? Yep, no, nobody's hurt yet. But see, when it comes to reporting medical device reports to the, to the um, FDA and agencies around, there's two questions. Did it cause a serious injury or death? But the harder one is, could it have caused a serious injury or death? And if this was a patient that was really, really at risk, and the system went down, and they fumbled around and they couldn't uh, you know, get it up in time, it's, there's a could of there. But someone's got to answer this. What do you think? Should it be taken off the market? And how many people think it should be taken off the market? Yep. So I was at MIT, asked the same question, and 100% of the people said take it off the market. Okay. Um, do you think we need to make design changes based on this? Obviously we do. Um, do you think we should report this to the clinicians and the patients? Do we need to get a, a letter out right away? Dear doc. Yeah. And then, um, even though it's outside the United States, do you think we should whisper in FDA's ear that this happened? And I, you know, one other thing I should say is we had a clinical trial on going to the United States, so you know, that, that means even more that we should let the FDA know. Well, um, I think you'll find it interesting. Let's go back and, and so I'm going to answer how, what we did with those questions. But I'm going to let FDA help me in a couple slides, so I'm going to hold off on what we actually did. But I want to go back to why did we not catch this? Why was the susceptibility of the electric pottery knife not, not, not picked up before? So, um, oops. so the bottom line is that both the electric pottery device, which was made by Covidian, which is a, at the time a $2 billion company in the lab experiment, and our device, we're both tested to our standard. Um, what we found is that um, when we tested them, the, the, the test, you know, the, basically the standard for electric pottery and ours did uh, suggest we had to test the 300 kilohertz, but it didn't cover the intensity of the harmonic, the intensity of that. So even though we tested and passed our electrical safety, we passed it enough for FDA, there was a gap in the standard. And so we went to FDA and said, and FDA said, yeah, you passed your testing, they passed their testing. Um, it's great, but there's a problem in the field. And um, so we asked, you know, what do you think FDA's response when they said, well, wait a minute, the standards never, you know, gave us the guidance that we needed to test for this risk of a device that we've never worked with. And their answer was, um, go create another standard. That was it. Not very helpful. Um, I also want to put it in perspective that when this, uh, when this happened, uh, there are 11 companies selling electric pottery devices. Each company sold multiple devices with, that all operated in different modes. This event occurred in one company's unit in one of their three modes. But, again, ethical question. Since we've seen this in one mode in one company's model, do we need to go test every company's electric pottery in every mode? And when you do the permutation, that's about 90 different tests. And it's probably going to take about a year um, to do all this. And that has to be documented. And by the way, we're not going to do it. We're going to outsource it because we want an independent party to do it. Uh, and so on and so forth. 
So the question is, do we need to do that? So, um, so what did we do that led to a recall? Uh, it might surprise you. Uh, we did not have any patient injuries on the device. Um, we decided to send that Dear Doc letter out to centers out to the United States. And uh, we also decided, you know, it probably is important to send a Dear Doc letter to the sites of the United States. So sending that letter was a class one recall. I'm not talking about the equipment. I'm not talking about technology. I'm saying sending a letter. When we told FDA we were going to send a letter, it triggered a class one recall. Now, class one recall, there's only 13 of these in the United States a year. They're the worst kind of recall. They're most serious to FDA. So that, I just want to say, right away you see, you think recall is, I got to bring all my, thing, my equipment back. It was just sending a letter. Now, we don't know yet what they're going to say about the equipment. And we just know sending a letter. So I want to say, you know, we kind of view that when you get on a plane, there are certain rules such as telephone should not interfere with the plane and its communication. And they would lead you to believe that if you do interfere, you put the plane at risk of potential hazard. I would argue that we were providing life support that we maintain the life, and the electrocautery folks interfered with us. Who should, have done, who should have been doing the recall? Well, we were life-saving, but we were only three million in revenues. Covidian was two billion in revenues. They could easily have afforded the recall, but FDA came after us. That, it makes no sense. You can't argue about it. But they went after the little guy because they knew that we would be the most responsible. I just bring that up. So, so the question is now you're now you're the engineers and you're in our company. So, how did the company react when they found out about this? And so, you know, we bring everybody in the conference room. And we got to let the, the board of directors know about this. So mostly investors, but you know. The board, they're, they're the boss of the company, so we have to let them know. We have to, we have to let the investors know. I mean, um, we don't know how long it's going to take, how much it's going to cost, and you know what's going to happen to the company. We, um, we have the senior manager dealing with them. We have the finance guy saying, how am I supposed to forecast on a quarterly basis how the company's going to do? Sales and marketing. Sales and marketing folks, people get paid on commission. They're saying, well, wait a minute. I, I'm not going to be able to sell a device. Should I look for another job? I mean, I might, am I going to get paid? Uh, manufacturing is saying, I've got 24 people that manufacture this device now. And um, you know, the question is, do I have to start laying people off? How long is it going to take? Obviously, you can't be producing anything. Regulatory affairs is involved, quality is involved, clinical affairs is involved, the other companies involved, the FDA is involved. But guess what? Everybody turns to who? The engineers. So who's going to fix this problem? The engineers. Uh, back to problem solving, back to leadership. I mean, everyone turns to the engineers and says, how long is this going to take? What's it going to take the picture? How much is it going to cost? So there's a lot of, I, even no matter what project you're working on, when a crisis like this happens, this is your project. Though. This is what engineers work on. So how does it feel to be an engineer at this point? I think this is probably the best way to do it. <laughs> How, do, how, do, um, how does the CEO and the rest of the people feel they feel a little bit like this? But you know, for the engineer, you got to be an independent thinker. And all you really should be thinking about is what affects the right to safety and welfare of the nation. It's like, I know there's a lot of financial pressure here. I know there's a lot of concern out there with investors. But i got to clear my mind and i got to be thinking about the right to safety and welfare of the nation. So, so what did we do? We had to send out this urgent voluntary advisory notice um, to the clinical center. And uh, that's what the letter was called. Oops. Had to, um, yeah, 
And we had the contact FDA's recall center and let them know that we're about to, to do this. And then um, um, they asked us to, to form this uh, it's a correction and removal report, which is now we're really worried because correction and removal, that word removal had us a little worried, as so though we are going to have to bring everything back. Um, then we received a message from FDA requesting root cause analysis, they want a failure investigation, risk analysis, anything that we could tell about electrosurgical units, and then um, a whole medical device reporting uh, program. So they asked for more information about electrocautery. They wanted all our labeling. Uh, they wanted a conference call with management uh, because of their concerns about how we're going to go about doing this and the urgency to get this uh, addressed. And then, uh, uh, so the bottom line is we uh, we did have a conference call with them. And uh, we agreed that we'd expand the, in the engineering investigation, include all the, all the devices on the market. Um, we would file medical device reports, which we weren't obligated to do, but with, with all the countries involved. And I just want to show you, uh, on that call was who's who from FDA all the way up to the top. This was so important that every uh, chief medical officer, the nursing, um, the acting chief, the acting deputy director, everybody's on this call. We were really in the hot seat. And more specifically, the engineers were in the hot seat. And here's what I want to come back to. I asked you what we should do with an end of two events. So first of all, we have the compliance side of FDA saying, listen guys, there's a big risk here. Uh, you have a flawed design, even though we've approved it five times. And um, you've had interruption of patient support. That's compliance. But then remember, for George and Steve, you remember CRH, Graham Zuckerman, you know, all of our reviewers, they were on this call irate with compliance because they said, well, wait a minute, let's think about benefits. You got over 8,000 patients, 43 percent survived compared to 25 percent. Um, you are going to pull a device off the market and you're going to let 25 percent of the patients die going forward, whether it could be saving them at the risk of two observations out of 8,000. So, anyway, uh, that was the situation. So we did have this call with FDA. We, um, we talked to their engineering group and came up with a protocol for them and worked very closely together with them on what to do. Um, sent them a, a, started working with the other company and uh, we agreed to test everything on the market. And so, um, we, um, we had a, a, a review and found out that all we needed to do was a software change. We had to um, then freeze the design um, we had to verify the design and um, contact FDA and uh, we updated the software. So I'm going to jump right to the, bottom, the last slide because I think it's most important. And that is, what was the solution? And the solution was the entire situation with the false positive. That there was no contact with um, the housing and the patients never were at risk. But we had to eliminate the alarm, and that was the solution. And it took us a year to do it, and all that effort, but the engineers solved the problem. So I'm going to stop there, and um, let people have to go. I see people have to get back to class. Anyway. Questions? Yeah. Yes? So when you get this recall notice, and yep. whatnot, what do you do about the patients who already are, are already on the device? Yeah, the good news is, uh, you know, first of all, you start that failure analysis, you realize the event is occurring during surgery when they get electrocautery events, and barring any surprises, we should not even see any patients uh, going through electrocautery once they're up and running. So the risk is pretty low. And again, um, when you're bridging to survival or recovery, then um, uh, again, the benefit outweighs the risk. So leave them on. And by the way, the same thing with implantable. I mean, with heart, XBE, we had valves that were breaking. Um, you, you, you know there's a known risk. 
uh, you look at risk benefit and you say, leave it in. Well, what's, we're not going to take it out. Yep. So did the FDA start looking at other instruments to see whether there were other uh, you know, medical instruments that were also being affected by the electric powder? No. I mean, they basically you know, honed in on what the problem was and very specifically addressed this problem. And it was up to us as the sponsor and manufacturer to take that into consideration. Should we see it happen with another device, we'd be right back in the same suit. So, yeah. This, uh, yeah, I mean, it's similar to your question. We obviously went through the standards and uh, tested uh, as best we could. We did all, by the way, repeated all the testing again, repeated it with all those units, but then repeated it to, and compared it against other standards to make sure there wasn't a known gap. Um, and it's not very reasonable to go beyond that uh, because you're so chasing a needle at the time. Do they update the standards? No. They've never been updated. <laughs> Although, um, I will say that there is a new ISO standard in process for this field. And I've been on those calls and I've made the, the folks aware of it. So it will be considered the future ISO standard. Hey, George, I saw your hand go up. Yeah. Would the, the verification and validation testing yep. that you did, that on the bench or did you have to do some analysis? That was all bench. Yeah, I mean, we did something I thought was a good way of going about it. Uh, we, this happened outside the United States, so we used our notified body, which happened to be TUB. We went to Germany and Munich, and we uh, had all of the devices tested for EMC testing with our notified body, which is about as independent as you can get. And uh, they were quite satisfied. So. And I saw your hand go up. Yeah, so for the future, would it be wise when designing such medical devices to go put a margin of safety over the FDA regulation? The answer is yes, but we assume the standard took that into consideration because it is above and beyond what you would expect. Nevertheless, yeah, uh, it's, it's worth testing as far a range around it as possible. Yeah. You said, certainly don't want to end up in this shape. Yes? Was there any interference from any other uh, electric car unit, or was it just limited to that one? That was the only problem we've ever had. That was just a, a unique situation, because I think that the bad standard in general did cover it. It's just this was a, a unique situation. Yep? Can you comment on the costs? For this yeah, I, um, it's, you know, if you take uh, loss of labor, loss of revenue, loss of everything, cost of fixing, probably about um, two and a half million dollars. Okay. Fortunately, we had the, um, the non-medical business that was uh, doing well, and it didn't affect that. So we, we had the industrial business covering us. Otherwise, we would have been in deep trouble. Stephen, I saw your hand go So uh, one of them was the cost of the other. So with the benefit of hindsight, would you have done anything different? I, I'm not sure that you could. I mean, uh, I guess I'd ask you the same question. Would you challenge every standard that you see? Um, <laughs> I mean, you take for granted that uh, it's been really adequately and thoroughly you know, vetted. I guess to me that looking at because it, it does look like what you did, but, but the other would be the timing of it, you know, because that sheer shock of like you said, you send that one letter that sends off that chain reaction. Yeah. How quickly, you know, do you respond? And you know, you, you mentioned the cost in terms of time lost and yeah, I mean, we, could, and we knew that was going to be very expensive. We knew that we ran the risk of having a lot of people go from the company due to delays and loss of revenue, uh, and we knew that when we made the decision to. Uh, we didn't think that sending the letter out would trigger it so fast. We didn't know, we, we didn't realize that was a recall. But we knew when they told us it was, we knew what we were in for. But we, I would not change that. We would do the same thing the next time. It, you're, it's the only responsible thing you could do at the time. But um, no, we did not take the device off the market. FDA decided at the end of the day they did not want us to take the device off the market. All they wanted was, I, I had a slide in there this is rather amazing how thorough FDA is. 
We were at, uh, in the United States, 140 clinical centers. FDA sent an agent to every single hospital. And when they got to the hospital, they, we, uh, they would call us and say, this hospital never got your letter. Fortunately, we used FedEx and tracking system. We could say, yes, we did. It was received by so-and-so. But they were all over. Um, so they take this stuff seriously. But how much did it cost the FDA in terms of their time and their calls? And they reviewed. It was all about the engineers um, work, you know, saying to FDA, rather than us just coming up with a protocol, working on it, sending in results, and say we solved the problem. We want to do it this way. We want to send you uh, and your engineers our protocol, review it, tell us what you like, don't like, send it back to us. Okay, we'll work on it. Here are our results. Very interactive. And that's how we turned FDA around from being adversarial. It's just like, you know, let's work together on this. You know? So uh, maybe it's kind of not the, uh, it, it's too simple a solution potentially, but given that this device was never taken off the market, why can't you just say, don't use this electrocautery with this device that will be solved the problem? That's what the, that's what the letter said. The letter said, if you use this in this mode, you run the risk um, of the system shutting down. Uh, so don't use that mode. And it was one device out of 11 companies on uh, one mode. So uh, I can tell you, it was the Valley Lab operating in a quadrant mode. And the uh, uh, FDA said that's, uh, that's a recall. And so nothing we could do about it. And, yeah. Yeah. So when, when sending this letter triggers the, the recall, it yeah. seems like that incentivizes companies to shove stuff under the rug. <laughs> yeah, it's scary. Um, uh, but would, would I do it again? Absolutely. Yeah. It's, yeah. Just, yeah. it's all about the ethical behavior of our people. You have to send the letter. Yeah. You, know, you can't have um, you know, surprises in Saudi Arabia when a you know, patient mm -hmm. shuts down. It, it's back to that question, could have it caused an injury? And that, you know, you can't sleep at night mm -hmm. knowing that. And so then it becomes, you know, you know, unfortunately, you have to face the investors. I mean, there's so many stories written about um, no one likes to deliver bad news, but it's really important to deliver it uh, quickly. Uh, yes? So do you have your own regulatory um, staff, uh, expert, or you hire someone? Uh, no, we had our own. Yeah. Yeah. As a matter of fact, I have one are sitting right back there, and that's Priscilla. She's both quality and regulatory in our current company. That's what, by the way, um, first hire that I make is quality and regulatory, even before I hire an engineer. It's so, you know, a lot of people don't operate this way, but um, design control, conceptual specs, product specs, user requirements, you know, setting up a quality system, that stuff, if you don't do that, um, you're going to have a nice device, but you can't get it on the market. So, yeah, we always have our own regulatory. They're good. Did you have a question? No? Any, anybody else? Yes? Uh, sell the market, so what did you tell them? Did they have, did you have to do layoffs? Did this impact the, the operation and the personnel? Yeah, I mean, sales and marketing people, first of all, uh, to give you an idea, as CEO, uh, I paid the head of sales and marketing more than I got. Sales and marketing people get paid more than anybody. Um, and, and the way you pay them is the more revenues and the more revenues they bring in, the higher they get. And so, but you gotta look at it from the company's perspective, the more they bring in, the better off you are. So pay them whatever they want. But when they don't have a product to sell and they're not going to get that commission, uh, they're not very happy. So you just have to be honest with them and say, you know, be part of this. Um, we're going to have, you know, initially daily, eventually <coughs> weekly updates just to let you know where things are. We'll, but the good news is uh, it, in this instance, when the FDA did not take the device off the market, they still had their sales market. But there was this period of time of un uncertainty. And uh, you know, everybody's, uh, it's, it's a lot of hand-holding. Um, 
But again, this was all about the engineering part. And everybody turns to the engineer, and that's why I say leadership role, building confidence, building trust. Uh, I, you know, I've been in companies where I did not respect it. You know, I've been brought in to companies where I did not respect the engineer. You know, if they were in a crisis like this, you know, you'd see an, an exodus of people. You know, they just don't have confidence that engineering is going to solve it. But fortunately, we were working with a good group. Yep. Yes, a question came to mind. Like, uh, if you have a competitor at this time, if, I, I, like, if you have a competitor at this time, have the same device doing the same issue. So would they would the APDA be the same manner with you? I mean, like leave your device in the market. If I had an injury, okay. no, if you had a competitor that does the same thing, so they're oh, probably. a competitor. Yeah. Um, they, you know, they, but to the best of my knowledge, uh, still risk benefit that they would allow it to be on the market. But, you know, their main concern is, you know if you're causing an injury in a patient, or if you're risking causing an injury. And this is such a low probability that um, they would leave it on. You know, the, your question's a good one. You'd have to know so much more, though. Was a did the competitor have better results, equal results? Mm -hmm. um, forget pricing, that's not FDA's concern. But um, if you were inferior to another device, um, you were just pure marketing, selling something, but you weren't as good, then you might run the risk that FDA would cease and desist the product until you get fixed. But you know, like, they rely on you to say, we've done our risk-benefit analysis, and we say the benefit outweighs the risk. And uh, they're doing it themselves, but it's your job to do it. And they'll either agree or disagree with you. Uh, but in this case, they clearly agree that the benefit of the device being out there are far away the risk. Yep. So sending these letters are definitely the most ethical thing to do, but from a marketing perspective, how does that influence the reputation of the company? Do they think that this company is ethical once they had this problem, they send it out? Or do they so what's you know, really interesting is that when FDA comes in uh, to do an uh, inspection, the first thing they ask is for the organizational chart. And when they ask that question, what they're asking is who's responsible? this in the company? And the answer to this question was, my name. And so when you get a recall, or I've been through a warning letter, on the internet, for everybody to see for the rest of your life, is Levitronics, is a recall, and it's a letter to the CEO by name. And so your name's out there, and if you Google on my name, you'll find a warning letter, you'll find a recall. And so it's, it's intractable. Um, but as far as I'm concerned, there's nothing embarrassing about a recall. There's nothing embarrassing about a warning letter. Uh, these are things that you learn along the way, and you learn how to deal with it, and you strive. So some people are bothered by it. The competitors can have a ball with it, and they can say, oh, you got a, you got a flawed device, uh, it's not worth it. But um, you know, that, again, is all your relationships with the centers and the doctors and people that you respect. And if, if they know you're ethical and they know you're trying and if the device works well, then it doesn't matter what anybody says about it. Yeah. Right? All right? Sounds good. I think we're all set. I, I haven't seen more questions.